Okay. Thank you, Andrea. So I'm going to be giving a set of lectures on the truncated conformal, or maybe better to say, just the truncated spectrum approach. And the aim of these lectures is going to be to try to describe how one can describe perturbations of integrable and conformal systems in a non-perturbative fashion using data or information coming from conformal field theories and integral field theories. And perhaps the, the philosophy of the, of the lectures is going to be, even though conformal theories or, or theories that are conformal or theories that are integrable are sparse or, or a set of measure zero in, in some sort of theoretical s model space, the, f the, the fact is that the conformal points or the integrable points contain a lot of information. And th this information serves as a useful starting point to describe the theories in the vicinity of these conformal and integrable points. And you can actually say a lot, you, you can actually get fairly far away from these conformal and integrable points using this truncated spectrum approach. And so describe much, a much bigger area of theory space than you might have expected otherwise. So, uh, so I'm giving three lectures, and the, the lectures will be roughly organized along the, the following lines. So it'll be this first lecture will be the the <coughs> the basics of the truncated spectrum approach, and so I'll I'll discuss the the, the and sort of describe in very s in show you how actual s simple it is. And in, in this first lecture, and, and I'll also show you some numerical data that comes out of a typical application of the truncated conformal spectrum approach, and that's where I will s I will rely on some uh, overheads of, of the graphs of the numerical data. But otherwise, the lectures will be will be on the blackboard. In the second lecture. I'll describe improvements on the on on the, the basic truncated spectrum approach, and these improvements will will take well m mainly they'll be come in the form of various renormalization group improvements. And and some of this some of this renormalization group improvement will be of a numerical. Form and it will borrow ideas from Wilson's numerical renormalization group as developed for quantum impurity problems. But it will also involve some analytic RG. And then in the final lecture, So in, the, in these first two lectures, I will mainly consider, well, I will only consider one-dimensional systems, one plus one-dimensional systems. In the third lecture, I will discuss how one can take this truncated spectrum approach, combine it with ideas coming from DMRG or matrix product states, and so as to be able to study two plus one dimensional systems, at least as conceived or as represented as, represented as w arrays of one dimensional large arrays.
of coupled one-dimensional systems. Now, I, I should also add, for people actually taking notes, that I will, damn, I will be, th these notes will form the basis of a review article that I'm in the process of writing that should be out probably by the summer. So there will be some proper notes available soon. So the basic problem, so the basic problem the truncated spectrum approach allows you to attack so well, you, you can write it in, in the following form. You can write the Hamiltonian that you're interested in studying as some perturbation of a known Hamiltonian, and I will describe what that means in a second. Okay. Plus some perturbation. So the known Hamiltonian, what I mean by a known Hamiltonian, is it's either going to be some CFT, Maybe I should add, for, for, for our, our purposes, this is a, a one plus one dimensional CFT. At least for my purposes, it's a one dimensional, one plus one dimensional CFT. Um, plus, or, so, so it's either CFT or it's some integral model. Now, it can be the integrable model can either be a, a field theory but it, it also can be a, some sort of lattice integrable model. There's no constraints here for this approach. <coughs> and for the field theory it doesn't have to, I mean it can be a Lorentz invariant field theory or it can be a non-Lorentz invariant field theory. So, for example, one can one could study. You know, I will I will detail the one of the major examples I will consider will be the quantizing model away from its critical point, and so then in the continuum limit described by a massive Majorana fermion. So that would be an example of a Lorentz invariant field theory, or one could also consider saying looking at the Lieblinger model, which is a continuum theory of one-dimensional bosons, but it's non-Lorentz invariant. So, in order to apply the truncated spectrum approach, you need a you need a number of conditions and the first condition is, is that you need to have you need to have complete control of the spectrum of h known and of course if you choose H known to be a one plus one dimensional conformal field theory or an integrable model, then this condition is certainly met. That's in fact why I referred to H known as H known, is because you have, com among other things, you have complete understanding of its spectrum. So that's basically why you need to consider H known to either be a conformal field theory or some integral model. Now, when I say you have complete control of the spectrum of, the, of H known, you also need to have, you, you need to,
you need to understand each known in finite volume. And in particular, you need to understand its spectrum in finite volume, which puts a, a bit more of a constraint on what on, on, on the H knowns you consider. And basically the reason why you need to understand H known in finite volume is because ultimately you're interested in doing numerics. And so th the only way you can do numerics is, is really in finite volume. One of the consequences of, of having H known in finite volume is that the the spectrum is discrete. The spectrum of, of of H known is discrete. So so that means you can take, you mean it really means that your spectrum looks something like this and you can, because you have complete control over the spectrum, you can take the spectrum and you can basically order the states in energy. Now, and that, that will be terribly important for what is to follow. Now, so one, one thing that we need to know, or why we, we call H known H known is is precisely because we have control of this discrete spectrum. The other thing we need to be able to implement the, the truncated spectrum approach is we need to understand the matrix elements of our perturbing field relative to this basis of states. So if we had so we, 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 it's 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 crucial that we understand these matrix elements. And again, this is this puts a constraint on the the known Hamiltonians we can under w that we can treat with this method. And it's it's a bit more severe constraint. Even if the the Hamiltonian is integrable, we don't necessarily we don't necessarily understand the matrix elements all in all cases of the of the of the perturbing operator that we are interested in. You know, in in for example, you know, we can have a th we can have theories that are integrable, but for example like like Lieb-Linegar and for certain operators in Lieb-Linegar we would understand how to compute these matrix elements but for other operators we wouldn't so you know a relevant example if we had the Lieb-Linegar model with periodic boundary conditions we could understand how to compute these matrix elements for relevant physical operators but if we had open boundary conditions these matrix elements aren't known that's still a sort of an open problem. So that, that would restrict our, the, that restricts ourselves, for example, with Lee Blinegar to only studying the system under periodic boundary conditions. So now if we have the understanding of the spectrum and we know these matrix elements. We can write the full Hamiltonian as 
as a matrix. And, well, and our, of course our ability to do so is predicated on, on, our, on the spectrum being discrete, which is, again, one reason why we work in finite volume. Now, this Hamiltonian is still an infinite dimensional Hamiltonian. And, so of course we... You can't do anything numerically with an infinite dimensional Hamiltonian. So the natural thing to try to do is to take our, our spectrum and truncate it. Yes? I, I, sorry? Yes, the spectrum is discrete. You expect it to be discrete if the system is in finite volume. Yeah, although there are, there are exceptions. For example, if you have a, a non-compact boson, the, the, the spectrum of highest weights, if you have a non-compact one plus one dimensional massless boson, the spectrum of highest weight states in such a theory is, can be represented as continuous, and that, that would be a problem for this this method so you have to you have to you would have to get around it but there are there are ways to do that but generically if you put a system so that's true if even this, this system's even in finite volume but generically if you put a system in finite volume its spectrum is going to be discrete so we have a matrix that's in uh, the Hamil the Hamiltonian matrix is infinite dimensional, so we can't do anything with that. So we we truncate the spectrum. So we we take our our spectrum. Well, we don't really need that. So we introduce a cutoff in the theory, and we just, states above this cutoff, with energy above this cutoff, we just ignore. Or at least we, we ignore for the moment. Most of the, the, the renormalization group improvement that I've talked about that will form the subject of the next lecture will be dealing with these states that we just tossed away, or looking at ways to incorporate these states into the problem. But for the moment, we've just introduced a very, very crude trunc truncation of the spectrum. Now our, our Hamiltonian, the Hamiltonian matrix is is finite dimensional. And so now we can just use exact diagonalization to to Diagonalize the, the matrix. And coming from this, this uh, exact diagonalization, we get the spectrum of the full theory, of the truncated full theory. And we get the ability to, because the exact diagonalization not only gives us, not only gives us the spectrum, it gives us the, the eigenvectors, so we can compute, we're able to compute the 
matrix elements of, of various operators. in the full theory. Yes? I mean, the full theory is the known theory plus the per perturbation. And again, our ability to compute matrix elements in the full theory is predicated on our ability to compute matrix elements of of operators relative to the, the, the basis of states, the basis of eigenstates of H known. Because when we do the exact diagonalization, the states that we get out will be expressed as some linear combination of the states of the known Hamiltonian. And so, provided we know these coefficients and provided we know these, these matrix elements, we can, always, we can always compute the matrix elements of the full eigenstates in the, f in, in the full theory if we know those. Okay. Yes? Well, the, there is, there is, a, there is, you can, you can make estimates, which we'll come to, you can make estimates of the error you introduce by introducing a cutoff. But of course, so you, you know how, I mean, typically what one does, or at least one way, you can do it, you can make, you can make analytic estimates of the error one introduces with the, the energy cutoff. You can also just sort of, you can, do your numerics at one cutoff. You can do a practical approach. You can do your numerics at one cutoff, do it at a higher cutoff, and see if your answer changes. And if it does, then you know that you're at least working on a particular problem where there's some cutoff sensitivity. But there are analytic ways to understand that, and that, that will be discussed. Mm. No, no. When you introduce a cutoff in the theory, the pro you, and you and you do this full diagonalization, you're still use, you're still incorporating non-perturbative. Yes. So true, you, you'll see that for, for uh, very, very small lambda, it looks like the theory is a perturbed conformal field theory. The spectrum looks still conformal. But as you increase lambda and you do this full diagonalization, you see that you, work, you, you move into a regime where you're actually describing non-perturbative information. I mean, the, the full exact diagonalization do is not, I mean, involves all orders in lambda. Yeah, so, so you do get to, you do incorporate. The in, typ in typically, typically when you when you look at uh, a perturbed conformal field theory, the the various masses in the perturbed conformal field theory have some non-analytic dependence on this lambda, which goes. I mean, if 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 you know if if this operator has a scale dimension of delta, then then lambda has a, a has a scale dimension of two minus delta, and that means the 
the masses in the theory are going to be proportional to so the the masses in the theory are going to have this non-analytic dependence on lambda and this picks it up and it you'll as as you'll see momentarily it picks it up very easily even with very very crude cutoffs so even even if you keep very very f as you'll see even if you keep very very few states you still do very very well describing the theory both in infinite volume even though you're working in finite volume and with no no cutoff and so you, you yeah so you'll see that and you'll see that this perhaps is then a rather powerful method to look at other systems just from this very simple example Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, well, okay, so typically, um, if I look at what the level spacing of these, uh, of these levels are, it's, it, well, if it's a, if, if, since this is sorry, this is this is known. This is the the known spectrum. This is this is the computational basis they're using. the The level spacing is going to be is going to be something like two pi over r, where r is the system size. Yeah. Okay. For so the level spacing is going to go as 1 over r. And if, if I vary r and want to keep a fixed cutoff, it means as I, vary, as I make the system larger, there are going to be more and more states that fall below a fixed cutoff. Actually, typically what one does is that, at least when you're studying con perturbed conformal field theories, you choose uh, a cutoff of the form as 2 pi 2 pi over r which is sort of the fundamental energy scale in the conformal field in the unperturbed conformal field theory times some integer which is your cutoff so you you fix the number of states but as as even though you're varying r and so as you f as you vary make the system size larger the typically the cutoff is coming down so the data that I will show you is, 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 is done that way. You fix the number of states, typically. But you can see where going to larger system size becomes, if you, I mean, it would be also very natural to fix the cutoff and have it independent of R. And as you increase R, it means the number of states below that cutoff would then become larger. So what do we want to erase now? So to show you how this, uh, how, how this method works and to show you, to show you how it can, it, it can be very, very successful, let's consider the quantizing model. So
So the quantizing model on the lattice is given by this. Now, for this method, at least for this model, it's it's actually at least much as you, as you will see, it's much better to work with the continuum version of this model. If we go to the continuum. And in the continuum limit, the theory is just the theory of a massive Majorana fermion. Oops. Okay. So, sorry. That's so important. We want to consider the quantizing model in a longitudinal field. These first two terms. are going to constitute what we call H known. The longitudinal field is going to be what we call the phi perturbation. So in the continuum limit, the mass of Majorana fermion is the known Hamiltonian And then we perturb it by the spin field in the continuum limit. Yeah. Spin. And of course, well, the 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 known Hamiltonian is trivial. It's just a free theory in the in the in the in the continuum limit because the the fermion fields, the left and right moving fermion fields, are non-local relative to the spin operator. The full theory is very, very non-trivial. And the, the perturbation of the, due to the spin field, changes things dramatically. So the, the two things I said you needed to analyze this model using the, tr the truncated spectrum approach is you have to know the spectrum, and you have to know the matrix elements. So the spectrum has two sectors in the continuum. And it has what's called the neville Schwartz sector, where the, the Fermi fields the Fermi fields are anti-periodic. So if I shift the Fermi fields by the system size, I get a minus sign. So you have an antiperiodic sector and you have a periodic center periodic sector which is known as the Ramon sector. And here the Fermi fields are periodic. Now the space of states 
depends for this theory depends on whether the ma whether the 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 Ising model is in its ordered phase or its disordered phase and whether it's in its disordered or ordered phase depends on whether the mass is positive or negative the mass if you uh the for this lattice model the critical point the critical point occurs g equals 1 if you want to when in mapping the the lattice model to the continuum model the the mass of the of the 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 mass of the of the fermion is basically the difference between well times g j the the overall coupling which should have be there for as well for dimensionality the the mass is basically just g minus 1 so so g less than 1 the system is ordered and the mass is negative If G is greater than 1, the system is, is in its disordered phase, and the mass is positive. Okay. So in the ordered phase, the, 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 the ground state of the system is, is doubly degenerate, so you get you get a, a, a you get vacuum states in each sector that are nearly degenerate so you get you have two vacuum states Oops, no. And the energies of these vacuum states are equal up to exponentially small corrections in the system size. Of course, because if you work in finite volume, you can't get a true spontaneous symmetry breaking, and that shows up by this, this exponential, exponentially small difference between the energies of these two states. Yes? Mm -hmm. So you 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 basically introduce Jordan Wigner fermions, and which are these non-local represent. I mean, they're 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 no, they're non-local in terms of the spin operators, and then you take the continuum limit of the of these fermions, and you get to this. No, so, sorry. Yeah. So I I. I at a later point, I added this j in to make things dimensionally correct. So yeah, I, w I want g to be just a number, and j sets the overall scale of the theory, of the, ener the overall energy scale of the Hamiltonian. Okay. So in the, so in the ordered phase, you have two degenerate, nearly degenerate vacuum states, and then... The excited states are just built as pairs of fermions on top of these vacua. So, um, so let's see. In the Neville Schwartz sector, you get You, you can get states which involve an even number of fermions where these are basically just the, the, the fermion creation operators. And 
because this is the Neville Schwartz sector where the fermions are antiperiodic, the the QIs here are 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 quantized as, as half integers. Okay. In the Ramon sector, In the Ramon sector, again, you have states that are built out of an even number of fermions, but the fermion momenta here are now just integers. Ordered phase. In the disordered phase, where the mass is greater than zero, You have one you have one vacuum state, the Neville Schwartz vacuum. And the excited states are built in the Neville Schwartz sector. The excited states are again. even numbers of fermions acting on the Neville Schwartz vacuum. But in the Ramon sector, you now have odd numbers of fermions. Over the Neville Schwartz vacuum. Well, or I guess you could say it's the Ramon vacuum, but you can't have the the Ramon vacuum doesn't exist as a state in and of itself because you you're only allowed odd numbers of fermions. So so we have even numbers of fermions. And really what's happening is that if you go to the lattice model and you, you solve the lattice model, you see that there's a zero mode which in the ordered phase becomes negative energy and you can, you can, you can take a particle, you can make a particle hole transformation on the zero mode. And so you, you can understand why the Ramon sector changes the number of fermions between being in the ordered phase and the disordered phase from the existence of this zero mode, having a negative energy in the ordered phase. Now, um, if you have an Odd number. The, the problem is in the in the in the Neville Schwartz sector. 
you want to consider states the, the sort of the 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 I don't want to write this if you have two states and you consider the matrix element of the spin operator you want you want this to be periodic and if i have an odd number of Neville Schwartz states. I mean, I can always use translational invariance in the system to basically Well, y when you consider perturbations, basically, when you consider perturbations by the spin operator, you're restricting, you bas essentially, you have to restrict your Hilbert space to the, the part of the Hilbert space where the, the matrix elements of the spin operator make sense or, or periodic. And so if you have an odd number of Neville Schwartz states, one of these momenta that comes about from in this matrix element from using translational invariance would involve a half integer and so you'd, you'd, this would be end up being minus. And I guess, I guess for this, this argument to quite make sense, you need to, as I will describe right now, the spin operator, the key aspect of the spin operator is that it, uh, it connects the Neville Schwartz and Ramon sectors. Its only matrix elements are between the Neville Schwartz and the Ramon sector. So the quantumizing model in the continuum limit Oh, okay, so uh yes, that's that's actually important. Um the the energy of of this state is well it's the the Neville Schwartz vacuum energy plus the energies of the various modes so this th this is just the 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 relativistic dispersion relation for the the fermion so yeah, it's ba it's a, the, the energies of these states are very very simple you just take the vacuum energy and you add the 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 energies of each of the modes because the mode because it's the underlying theory is not interacting it's just a simple sum of the modes and and the exact same thing for the ramon sector Yes, but it's it the difference between e yes, e the vacuum energies of the Ramon and Neville Schwartz sector is exponentially small, in 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 the mass and the also in this case yes, and so and so I mean it's really I mean you really have to have very ridiculously small r for this to make a difference and so we're almost always going to be working in a regime where r is big enough that this correction is is just completely negligible. Okay. Okay, so what are we doing for time? So the the key as the the as I said the key elements of the of 
of using the truncated spectrum approach is complete control over the spectrum in finite volume, which we do have for this this model. But you also have to know the matrix. Out. Yes, Eric. Um, I mean, there is, I mean, at the critical point, the degeneracy is present. It it show it, it shows up in in sort of the. I guess it would show up in the highest weight states for the the one sixteenth. You basically have a a, a a sigma vacuum and a mu vacuum at the conformal point. So yes, that th this this uh, you can. You can take the the m equals zero limit, and and make sense of the fact that you have odd numbers of Ramon fermions in one phase and even numbers in others because the Ramon sector has a zero mode, and if the mass is zero, then the the at the at the critical point, the energy of the zero mode is zero it's not gapped and so you can you can imagine the 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 Ramon sector in the ordered phase being mapped onto the Ramon sector in the disordered phase as m goes to zero by the absence or presence of this zero mode so that's how you get between even having even and odd numbers of, of fermions in the in the as you go towards the critical point so yeah so all of this holds as for m goes m goes to zero. It was just uh, the reason why I wanted to look at the finite m cases because it will be useful as an example later on, particularly when we look at two-dimensional systems or two plus one-dimensional systems as a, as a simple example where we're coupling together Ising chains, but also because I can write down explicit, it's one of the few systems where you can write down it's one of the, the, the few massive systems in finite volume where you can write down the matrix elements exactly in, in simple closed form. I mean, for other integral models, the for other integral models, the for other massive integral models, the matrix elements or the form factors do exist, but they typically you have to work a lot harder to get even the expressions for the simplest of the of the matrix elements never mind sort of generic for general uh, matrix elements involving generic numbers of particles so the matrix elements so the matrix elements of the spin field so sigma only connects the Ramon and the Nebo short sector, the, the matrix elements between states within a single sector of the spin field is zero. And regardless of whether you're in one phase or the other, So a generic matrix element between a Nevo short state and a Ramon state of this operator I'm gonna have to takes the following form.
so it's a product of, well, first of all, I've introduced these rapidity parameters, and these rapidity parameters are defined as just a, a parameterization of, of the momentum Q. And one introduces these, you could almost call them angles because they have simple, simple transformation properties under Lorentz transformations. Um, so you have these rapidity parameters Q. You have basically these finite volume factors which appear in these finite volume matrix elements. which are basically 1 over the square root of the mass times the system size times cosh of theta. And then you have this F term, which is a function of all the rapidities, and which is actually what the matrix element would, would, would become if you went to infinite volume. and can be very compactly written as a product of the QIs and the KIs cotangent theta QI minus theta So there's a product of cotangents coming from involving differences of rapidities in terms of the the, the Neville-Schwartz rapidities and the Ramon rapidities. And you might think that there's some issues with these matrix elements blowing up on you, but because the Neville-Schwartz rapidities are always quantized with half integer momentum and the Ramon Rapidities are always quantized with respect to integer momenta. This cotan these cotangents are always finite. So these cotangent factors, and you also have these tangent factors, which involve rapidities of the same type. So, oh, have I screwed this up? Um, no, no. Yeah, N1 should be, should be N prime. Uh, yes, yeah, so let's go 2N, N prime, N prime. Yes, yeah, no. These, these are, these are th this, this formula is completely general for any number of particles on either side. And it holds whether the, you're in the ordered phase or the disordered phase, 
so maybe you have to you have to understand these these uh, finite volume factors as you know of course having an absolute sign around the mass um because there 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 are there are there are 2n Ramon, sorry, 2N Neville Schwartz fermions. J equals 1, so that should be J. And. Yeah. Yeah. No, so this is, this is for the Ramon sector KL. Yes, yes, sorry. Yes, yes, that should be right. Yes. But in any case, yes. So so this is one of the few examples where you can you can you can write down the matrix elements exactly in such a short space. Any other integral model, any massive integral model, it would it's 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 a much larger production to figure out what these matrix elements are and typically you can only write down the matrix elements involving small numbers of particles for a general massive integrable model you mean how, how do you how do you get the matrix elements in general well the the, the pre there there are the, these matrix elements because it's Lorentz invariant theory ha satis have to satisfy well among among other things have to satisfy certain analyticity relations in the rapidities and so you can use these constraints to derive these 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 matrix elements and the reason why it's it's relatively simple in the case of the Ising is that the the S matrix of the Ising model is minus one, and in a so that makes these solving these analyticity constraints on the matrix elements, which usually goes under the name sort of the form factor bootstrap approach. The solving these analyticity constraints on the matrix elements is very simple because the S matrix is so simple. If I have a general integrable model, the S matrix for the various excitations in the model is going to have be some non-trivial have some non-trivial dependence on the rapidities and so solving the analyticity constraints becomes a complicated problem. Well, of course, they, I mean, it, that's, that's not enough. I mean, the, you know, if you permute, I mean, if you permute two Ks, you have to see the minus sign because of fermions in the, in the, in the matrix elements. But, but generically, that it's, it's just, yeah. Um, yes. So, yeah, yeah. In, in, in properly interacting theories, these matrix elements are much, much more difficult to drive. And you... You know, you have to go away and read Smirnoff's book, and that takes a while. Um, should we take a break? Yes. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's at a good point. We can take a break. And expect to get decent results. The, the, the excitations in the, in, the, in the system have the... the okay.
Okay. Go forward. Okay. So an advantage or one reason to to look at this or to consider this example in detail is that in the m equals zero limit the the quantizing model perturbed by a longitudinal magnetic field is an integrable theory. And so that means you know ahead of time, I mean the advantage is, is that you know ahead of time what results you expect. And so the, the, the spectrum of the quantizing model, the critical quantizing model in the magnetic field is quite rich. There are eight fundamental excitations. The first excitation you can see is setting the energy scale of the full problem. And so it will be some number times the magnetic field to the 8 15th. And that's, that's effectively a reflection of the spin operator in 1 plus 1 having a, a scaling dimension of 1 8th. So that means the, you know, the, the, the scaling dimension of H of the magnetic field is 2 minus 1 8th. And so the, the mass is, any mass is going to have to be proportional to to this power of H. So, but to, and C is in principle computable. Um, but the, the key thing that to, to, to note here is that there's a non-analytic dependence of the mass on the, the, the strength of the perturbation. And so if this method is to work, it must pick up, it must be able to, to, to capture this non-analyticity. So the remaining excitations can then be can be written down in terms of this fundamental energy scale. space so on and so this is uh, this is actually a r nice result of integral field theory coming from you know Zamologikov both of them Maybe 
you know, it would be useful in 1.6. The, the first two particles are yeah, are below the two particle threshold, but because this is an integrable model, you can have you get excitations that are above the two particle threshold that are stable and don't decay. And this, the, these, these eight excitations have the eight excitations are 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 reflective of an E eight symmetry in the model, but in a in a very non-trivial way i mean it's not obvious that if you look at the lattice model of quantumizing in a magnetic field that there should be an e8 symmetry lurking there in some way but there is now the other thing to note is that uh, that may be as a, as, a, as a useful factoid for this model is that it's not just a, a pretty piece of mathematical physics there are actually materials that realize this, this, uh, this, uh, this spectrum, or that there are spin chains So this uh, cobalt niobate that's been seen in this material, and would be and whenever you can claim to have observed an E8 symmetry, you get into science. So yeah. Well, you, you need, I mean, in any, in, any, in any material, in any realistic material, there's going to be interchain couplings that you have to worry about. And the, so you need small, you need, for this, for this, for this to be seen, you need small interchain couplings. And, but, well, so I mean, in any, I mean, th this this cobalt niobate is a 3D material, and so you have I it's a r it, it's it's this ordered 3D array, array of chains, and if there's a if a there's a cup a, a strong enough coupling between the chains, that's going to destroy this physics, and so you need to the material you need to be able to have a small enough interchain coupling that it can be treated in mean field, and in fact the sort of the, the mean field treatment of the of the interchain coupling is what gives rise to the longitudinal field so you need a weak interchain coupling and you need to be able to tune the individual 1d chains to their critical point that's also non-trivial i think they do it with pressure but yeah so you, so you need a rather specialized set of conditions where you need to be fa fairly clever experimentally to to find a, a material system that will actually be able to realize this this E8 symmetry, and even there, I mean when they when they I mean the way they they measure the spectrum, you know they do some sort of neutron scattering, and so you know they're 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 looking at the the imaginary response of a spin-spin correlator. And so, you know, they see... So this, 
you know, this would be M1, this would be M2, and they would, so they, 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 they measure some, some spin response function and they, they definitely see the first two excitations. They see that the, the second excitation has this, this, uh, this, this basically the, the golden ratio relative to the first excitation. I believe they see M3, but then there's going to be, uh, for the higher excitations that are above the two particle threshold, they have integrability breaking to worry about. The, the actual size of these peaks for the higher excitations becomes much smaller, so beca your life becomes much, much more difficult. There have been, uh, following this work, which came in, in 2010, there's been very accurate, more accurate ESR experiments done by Peter Armitage at John Hopkins, where they've seen much more of the spectrum. But yeah, so for, the, for this first observation, things, things, things were more difficult. Okay. So let's go back. So, so this this is all anal well, this is all analytics. So you know the model is integrable, and so you know the model is integrable. You know what you know what the spectrum is exactly. And so now let's let's go back to the truncated spectrum approach and see what you get. And so, or actually, let's see what we get, see what Zamologikov got back when he originally studied this model using the truncated spectrum approach. So, now when Zamologikov did this. He did this back in '91. Sorry. I think they were. I think the. I, I don't think. I think it was Sasha who did this. Not. Uh, sorry. Yes. Yes. Sorry. Yeah. This is Alyosha Zamologikov, and that's Sasha. Um. No. Yes. Yes. Um, so he did this back in 91. Computers were noticeably not as powerful back in 91 as they are now. And so when he did his study, he, he took a truncation keeping only 39 states. So all he had to di all he had to diagonalize was a 39 by 39 matrix. Now, if you if you think think about this for a minute, if you were to study a lattice Ising model, not the continuum version, if you were to study a lattice Ising model, keeping only 39 states, you know you would you know numerically. You know, this would be equivalent to studying uh, a, f a five to six site lattice model. And so, you know, of course, if you were to study a lattice model with five or six sites, you wouldn't get very far in terms of horrible finite size scaling. So when he studied this 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 model, he 
for the first four excitations above the fundamental excitation, I must have copied something wrong. No. Yes. Okay, good. So instead of six eight one, this should be six one eight. Yes. Oh, yes, that probably is. Ah, <laughs> uh, no, sorry. Yeah. So So yeah, the, the they should be in units of M two. Which which number? Uh, eh. Yes, you're right. I can't read my own notes. Okay. So. But what you see is that, well, I mean, you see a couple things. You see you see a very small cutoff gives very, very good answers. And the thing to stress is that these answers are, these, these, these excitation gaps are not in finite volume, but they're, they're the infinite volume gaps. Reproduced. So even though you're working in finite system size, f you know, in a finite system, it, it's clear that these finite si the, the, these finite size corrections are exponentially suppressed. So finite system size corrections. Yeah, you probably can't read it. So the finite system size corrections are very very small, allowing you to, to get answers that are valid in infinite volume. So you you've done very, very little numerical work, and you've gotten very, very good answers. And so it's this, this basic observation that makes you want to take this method and try to apply it to other systems. If, if this hadn't worked back in 1991 so very well, there probably wouldn't have been any follow-on work. But the fact that you don't have to work very hard to get very, very good answers. means it's worth pursuing. And one reason why it does work so well which maybe not have been quite obvious at the time. One reason why it works so well is that the spin operator is very, very relevant.
the, the scaling dimension of delta sigma is very small. And in ge generically, the smaller the scaling dimension of the operator that you're, you're perturbing the theory by, the better. The more relevant the operator is, the better. And basically the reason why is because the operator, more relevant operators, do not mix the high energy and low energy Hilbert spaces. Clearly, even though Zemologikov, Sasha Zemologikov, used a very, very crude truncation, it was clear that that the, the high energy states were not needed to reproduce the 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 low energy physics. And that's because the this spin operator just was not mixing these states in strongly. It was not connecting the high energy and low energy Hilbert spaces. If instead you had a marginal operator, your life would be more difficult. Not impossible, but more difficult. You wouldn't necessarily expect to get cutoff dependent results. Okay, so at least for the last 15 minutes, what I want to do is, uh, so I've just told you what Zamologikov result, th the results are from this, this old paper. So I wa want to actually look at some of the data that comes out of a, the, the diagonalization of the coming from the, the truncated spectrum approach to acclimatize you to, to, the, to w what you would expect. So let's see. So, in general, I mean, one way of often presenting the truncated conformal spectrum approach data is to plot the data. One very useful way of handling the data is to plot it as a function of system size, or to plot the energy levels as a function of system size. And typically, what you see is what we have up there. You have the various energy levels. Well, you know, sort of do. So for all but the very smallest R, which I will come to in a minute, the energy levels <coughs> typically have a form Take the form of these these uh, uh, lines. Well, this this first state here is the vacuum state, and the the vacuum energy for for reasonably large R will typically take this form. And then the 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 other the other excited states, or at least the first few excited states, will then just be shifts of the, will be, will be constant shifts relative to R from this ground state. Now you get something that looks a little bit better when you subtract off the ground state. Hmm. 
Yes, alpha is negative. Yes. That's a generic feature. The energy, the, the vacuum energy density is the is negative. Okay. So you subtract off the ground state energy. And plot it as, as a function of R. You typically see some sort of behavior. Say the, the the lower lying excited states have this form, at least for yeah, yeah. at least if you're dealing with a single particle excitation. And you can see that there are different regimes as a function of R. In this, in this regime, as you, as you increase R, you basically are taking the theory from the UV limit to the IR limit. And so in the, in the UV limit, when R is very, very small, the energy levels will still look like they're a conformal field, coming from a conformal field theory. And so that means that the the EIs will will basically depend as one over R plus you know perturbative corrections perturbative corrections in H. As you increase in R, you get to a regime where the system is no longer in the deep UV. It no longer looks like it's a, just a perturbed conformal field theory, but there are still finite size effects. And yeah, these, these finite size effects at least as you approach this dashed line, the finite, sex size correct the finite size corrections in this box are going as, yeah, let me do that again, are, are exponentially small, so the, the delta energy. are small. As you increase R, R further, you get into a regime where you're basically in infinite volume, or where the excitation energy is that of an infinite volume system. The, the, finite, the finite size corrections, because they're exponentially small, have now been suppressed to a sufficient degree that you don't see them anymore. And so this is this is sort of the the I mean if you're trying to extract the low lying spectrum of a perturbed theory, this is the value of R that you want to work at. Because you're in the the finite the finite size corrections have now all disappeared, they've been exponentially suppressed away. You're basically look and, and your data is representative of the infinite volume system. Now, you don't want to go too far in R because eventually the Typically, what you see is that the 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 straight line then becomes starts to bend away from this asymptotic line, this this dashed line, and there you, you this is basically what you're seeing are cutoff effects.
And remember when you are for this type of plot, the cutoff the actual energy of the cutoff, you, you're working at a fixed number of states, but because R is increasing, that means your cutoff is coming down. So for large R, you have a smaller cutoff, and you, this deviation of the, of the excitation energy from this the it's infinite volume result uh, uh, value at large R is due to the fact that this cutoff is coming down. So there's always delicate balance when you're doing these types of calculations, you want to work in a in a in a system size that's large enough to be away from the UV limit, large enough to be away from these finite size corrections, but not too large, so that you are in a regime where you're seeing cutoff effects. And of course, for certain types of theories, this intermediate regime, the sort of the sweet spot, can be very small. When you do the numerics, of course, the you f you fix you 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 give the strength of the perturbation, in this case the magnetic field, just a number. So that's that's why there's. But of course, you could you could re-express. You could you could def you, the way you would define a unit of energy is to write some mass scale as for for this the case at hand as eight fifteenths of of the 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 strength of the perturbation and then express the units in terms the units of energy in terms of this fundamental mass scale and that would leave and so if so if you were to run your numerics with a different a different value of the magnetic field strength but worked in these rec in, in terms of energies expressed in terms of this mass scale, you would see no change. So there would be a scale invariance, provided you also express the system size in terms of some natural units of system size. So you'd have to inter you'd have to in in you know you'd have to plot it if you plotted the energies in terms of that mass scale and versus m times r then different values of the, the coupling constant would lead to exactly the same results. Okay. No. No, the scale of the scale I mean I could do this the this the scale is the scale that comes about in the perturbed theory, not in the, the the base theory. So this mass scale is arises from the, the magnetic field perturbation. It's not if I were to have a if I was perturbing a uh, a massive theory, it's not this mass scale wouldn't arise from the original mass. It's the the mass in the full theory. Yes, this theory is massive. So yes. The, the the underlying the the critical Ising model that I'm perturbing is of course is is, is massless, but th then when I turn on a magnetic field, it becomes gapped. Um, sorry, no, no. So this would be the, the this would be some mass scale in the full theory. So it could, it, it it would so this mass one. This could be, you could just, you, I mean, depending on which mass scale you choose, of course, you change the, this, 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 this number, which is just a number. But this mass scale here is always proportional to this particular uh, uh, power of the, of the coupling constant. So, yeah, so th whenever I, for, for, for the, so the, uh, these ma mass scales are dynamically generated. They're not. They have nothing to do with the unperturbed theory, and so and again because the numerics picks up 
on this non-analytic dependence, it mean you're doing much better than you. So I mean, it's picking up a non-perturbative data. You're not just you're somehow not just doing numer numerical perturbations here. You're doing something more. Okay. No, no. Even if it's not integrable, even if it's not integrable, the the mass. I, I mean, if I was perturbing a conformal field theory by some relevant operator, the the mass scale would always be set. I mean, in 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 general, it would always be. S it would. It would well, let's call it lambda. So the mass scale is always set as 1 over 2 to the minus the scaling dimension of the perturbation, regardless of, of integrability or not. The only, the only advantage, the only reason to consider this specific example is, that we is to show you that the numerics works in a very, very efficient manner because we, kn we know what the answer is ahead of time. If we didn't know what the answer was ahead of time, it, it would not make su for such a compelling... Uh, a compelling check of the methodology. So, let me just quickly. So the 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 I, I've said that you want to avoid working at too large of R so that these cutoff effects are, are where these cutoff effects are are seen. But you can see if that if you increase the number of states, you see that so you see the the, the drifting ups of the of these levels. That's where you're beginning to see cutoff effects. But if you increase the if you increase the cutoff then these lines just flatten out. Of course, at, at large enough R, they'll always begin to arc up. Is there a small miracle? Well, I'm not going to... I don't know if I want to... I mean, my guess is that, you know, Zemologi Zemologikov was suffici is sufficiently clever was sufficiently clever that he probably foresaw, I mean, he wouldn't have bothered to go through the effort of, of, of doing the numerics, because he's not really a numerics kind of guy, if he didn't think it was going to work. So he probably foresaw that this would, this would work, although I don't think he could, could foresee quite how well it would work. I mean, yeah, because you, he really kept very, very few states, and he got, you know, answers even f for the higher order excitation. Well, as I as I say, the, the 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 basic understanding is that the spin operator, the perturbing operator, is very very relevant, which is which means that in an RG sense, it does not mix the high and low energy Hilbert spaces. If you have a perturbation that mixes the high and low energy Hilbert spaces, you're you're never you're never going to be able to produce cutoff independent results. But if you have a very very strongly relevant operator like the spin operator. Then you do. Then you, then you you're you're working in a you're set up you you've set yourself up in a situation where the cutoff effects are likely to be small, but of course without checking, you don't know that ahead of time, and so I think it was it was, it's not surprising it worked. Maybe it was surprising that it worked so well with so little effort. Yes. Yes, I would say the same argument is true. Yes, no. So, I mean, you can perturb massivizing. You can put a mass scale into Ising, and 
the, 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 the spin operator still maintains, even the, under the mass perturbation, it still maintains a notion that it has a small scaling dimension. Because at, 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 uh, if, you work, if, you, if you look at energies much greater than the mass scale that you've, in, you've introduced at the start, the, the mass of the fermion, then the theory goes back to looking conformal. And so, and so the, the, the sort of the operators, when they're acting in this high energy Hilbert space, still look like they're conformal. Well, no, no, no. I guess what I'm saying that if I'm perturbing the massive quantizing model, I would still, uh, the, the question is, 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 does the spin perturbation in the massive quantizing model mix states at very, very high energies with low energy states? And the answer is no, because at very, very high energies, the theory looks conformal. And so the original, sort of the, the, the you can definitely believe that the scaling dimension, th that the spin operator, when it acts on the high energy Hilbert space is still very, looks like its conformal counterpart. And so is it will mix, the spin operator in the high energy Hilbert space will mix states at high energies strongly among themselves, but it won't bring something down to low energies. So, my, I might, should I wind up now or should? Let me just, let me just, let me just deal with this last state or this last view graph and then we will continue tomorrow. So, it's, it's, uh, the point I want to make is that while you want to work, you want to work in this regime of the, of the, of the theory, if, you w if you're after sort of the, the excitation, the low lying excitation spectrum in infinite volume, the, this region at, sm at smaller r of, 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 the, of the theory is something you still under have under very good control. So in particular, if you just looked at the ground state energy as a function of r, you know, you get something that looks like this. Where this, and so in this regime, the ground state energy has this has this form, where where again this you know, this mass is the dynamically generated mass scale. Here, the this arcing off to negative infinity is just a result. of the of the energy of the of the conformal ground state dropping off as or blowing up as one over r and so but in this regime you can ask what the ground state energy is And in general, the way the, the, the ground state energy approaches this asymptotic line is exponentially fast, where this, this, this exponentially fast with R, and where this M1 This M1 is the lowest lying uh, excitation in the system. And the, what's, what's nice about this is that you can actually, you can, you can actually compute this correction.
this correction is given by is given exactly by this integral. And basically what's happening, if you wanted to think in terms of diagrams, of Feynman diagrams, what's happening is that at finite volume the system is able to virtually produce or the ground the, these are basically vacuum fluctuations. There's particle pr uh, virtual particle production where uh, an excitation of M1 of mass M1 is emitted from the vacuum. It travels around the circumference of the system. Remember, this, the system is living on a circle and then gets reabsorbed. And that, that sort of process is suppressed by the volume of the system. Yeah, so this is, the, I mean, you, you've done something. I don't, I don't mean Feynman diagrams in the original, in the, orig the, the original theory, because there are no masses. In, I mean, if this is a perturbed conformal field theory, there are, there are no masses. So this is really a, a, di a, a diagram. I mean, if you were to think about it in the underlying theory, then it would be some infinite resummation of diagrams. But I'm thinking about a theory that has a, a mass. If you, just, y if you just imagine, I have a theory with some set of massive excitations, I stick it in finite volume, how do I correct the ground state energy? You're going to get this, this sort of these, these vacuum fluctuations that will take this form. And of course, there will be contributions coming from the, high, the heavier excitations. I mean, I for the Ising model, the, the M1 is just the first excitation. There are other excitations in, in the system that will produce similar exponential factors, but because M2 is the higher, higher excitations are heavier, these, these exponentials will be smaller. And so you can actually check that, this, that, that, that the approach of the ground state energy is exactly this. Okay, so let me, let me leave, leave it at there. So, yeah, so, so at next lecture, I will, I will finish off by discussing which I think is, is useful, the, the finite size corrections on the, the single particle excitations and discuss briefly the, the how one detects the two particle excitations in the, in, in the spectrum, in the, in the numerical spectrum that one gets out, and then move on to the renormalization group improvements on, the on, the, on this approach. Okay, thank you. Kay.